Good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us. My name is Malaya. Here at IT Supplies, I am a textile print specialist, and I just want to thank you guys for joining us on, as we do take a application deep dive on the HP Stitch. Today, I'm joined by Jeremy Pilcher, an AMS textile solution architect for HP. But before we get started, I would like to mention that all attendees will be muted throughout the webinar to reduce background noise. During the webinar, we do Jeremy, you there? Hey, yes. My audio just got a little crazy. Apologies. Sorry about that. So I missed the last part. Are, were you, did you get done? Uh, yeah, it's all you. Awesome. Oh, apologies. Uh, so this week, uh, as you can see before you on the screen, uh, we're going to uh, deep dive into applications with Stitch. Um, last week, we talked about the uh, technology aspects of Stitch, and I'm going to cover those real quick before we, uh, well, kind of a refresher um, before we dive into our applications. But I also thought, well, if we're going to do applications deep dive this week, well, I might as well just wear uh, one of our applications. So um, let me know if you uh, like this uh, motocross suit. Uh, this was designed uh, and printed and sewn um, from our worldwide team in or our uh, business unit in, in Barcelona. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later on in, um, in the webinar. But uh, I just thought it would be a really nice touch to, you know, put it into action as one of our, you know, um, applications that we're going to talk about. So um, moving forward, let's cover the basis real quick on what we talked about last week. Uh, again, this is a two-part session. Last week, we talked about the technology aspects of this. If you have any questions about this as well, um, feel free to uh, put them in the chat. We will answer um, answer these questions throughout the webinar today. Um, but here, here's the S500 sitting in uh, my uh, basement office. Um, and what I really like about this, and one of the things we talked about is the fact that I can fit it in this room, push it up against the wall, and I still am able to access the input and the take up on this printer. Uh, everything is front loaded and they're in it. And it's also spindle -less, So the footprints goes down and the uh, ease of use goes up. And also I, these heavy rolls that come off, I don't have to bend down except for this far and not have to, uh, worry about hurting my back to, to get any far down to take off a roll. Uh, the window on the front, very nice feature. Also, there is a light inside so that you can see what is going on in the print zone. Um, another good feature about this window, uh, of course, is being able to see what's going on in there, but um, you have to keep this closed. You know, a lot of sites that I've been to, they like to print with it wide open here. But with this printer, because we start heating in the print zone as it's printing, it is a good idea to keep it closed. And the window just allows you to have access visually into the print zone. Also, the touch panel, eight inch touch screen, very user friendly, very intuitive. Uh, again, very easy to use and a nice functionality uh, for this printer. Um, you just heard me talk about the drop, the uh, print zone dryer. Um, we actually have a heating unit or a resistor that um, blows out hot air into the print zone. So because of our thermal inkjet print heads, we were able to uh, utilize heating in the print zone to help drying the, the media. Also with that, we have a, a, a optical drop detector. Um, we talked about this too during your cleaning cycles. It detects any nozzles that are missing and starts a compensation process for those if it cannot recover them in the cleaning process. Optical media advanced sensor um, takes pictures of the back of the material so that it will um, take into account any deviations in the advance of the material and compensate for that um, uh, problem in the, or that deviation in the advance so that you will not have any banding um, as it is printing and taken up or being taken up. Um, also, first printer in the industry to have a spectrophotometer built into it. 
the spectrophotometer takes a density um, reading of the material um, when you set the material up and also after you uh, replace a print head because we have user replaceable print heads um, it will ask you to do a color calibration after that and we're able to do that on the machine before it's sublimated so we can take a true picture or fingerprint of our printer um, before we even add any kind of deviations um, as far as you know heat um, a lot of times when you do your linearizations you have to print them off press them and then measure them and if there's any kind of issue with your heat press um, it's going to throw those measurements off so very good feature to be able to take a fingerprint of your printer before we even apply the heat um, three liter ink cartridges um, and also the intermediate tanks that allow these cartridges to be hot swappable um, very nice very clean bulk system that's not a bulk system you have to add on it comes with the printer so there's no containers that you have to pour ink on and worry about getting uh, ink splash everywhere or even pouring in the wrong color in the wrong container um, which I have seen countless times in my days in production um, and two of the biggest things we talked about last week that I uh, want to make sure that we hit this week one is our print head thermal inkjet print head last week we talked about the difference between thermal inkjet print heads and piezo print heads we talked about the pros and the cons um, between both of them uh, the pros on this one user replaceable um, and there's four times more nozzles roughly four times more nozzles than than um, our competitive piezo print heads which means you can get more nozzles or more um, dots per square inch where our native resolution on this is is 1200 um, dpi all the way down into one pass if we choose to print that fast so typically with piezo print heads to get the higher resolution you have to go up in your passes so here our native resolution is 1200 uh, dpi uh, we also talked about the difference last week between contone and half tone printers this printer is a contone printer and it's different than the half toning printers um, that are in sublimation and really what that boils down to is half toning all of your processing is done uh, in the rip and it's very rip dependent contoning in uh, for HP all the processing and all the settings and all of your color is stored within the machine so this makes it a very good option um, to store everything in one place let's say you change rips or your computer goes down then you don't lose all your data you can uh, reinstall the rip sync it with a printer and all of your settings are then synced back into your rip it also gives us a way to deploy our same the same color from printer to printer and add to our fleet seamlessly and we can do this a number of ways whether it be the web interface within the printer or we have print os which is a very good option to go into to be able to save your settings and deploy and to color manage your your printers and also it gives you a uh, um, with that you have the media locator which you can download profiles onto your printer now with that being said that pretty much is in a nutshell what we talked about last week uh, again if you have any questions about that feel free to ask them um, no problem answering those um, but moving forward we want to jump into uh, applications we want to do a deep dive on these so what are some of the applications um, <clears throat> with die sub that um, this printer is very good for pretty much all of them um, but we want to talk specifically about each one of these and we want to set this up uh, a little bit differently than how I normally would approach um, <clears throat> applications so I want to talk about uh, no so applications simple so applications and complex so applications and, and what I mean by that is if you're looking at getting into dye sublimation, it can almost be overwhelming because you're thinking, I need to buy a printer, I've got to figure out how to do finishing, and part of my printing process is not is now um, adding a heat press to it. So everything that I would print, like back here I'm printing on paper, this needs to be run through a calendar uh, with the fabric so that the ink can then gas from the paper into the fabric. And when you start thinking about this pricing and finishing equipment and all this can be overwhelming so I want to kind of go through the uh, I guess chain of events <clears throat> so to speak 
and give you a simple way to get into dye sub, but also let's start, we'll talk more about the complex sewing and other sewing applications that may entice you to get into dye sub, or if, it, if you're already into dye sub, it may give you some ideas of how to add to your portfolio. So that being said, let's talk about the simple way um, no sew uh, applications. And what I want to start with with this is, let's say um, you're into marketing and these items would be printed on paper and they would be pressed into um, something like a coaster. So let's, let's start there. So I have these coasters, they are soft coasters and they have a rubber backing and then there is a knit fabric that is laminated on top of this. Um, the benefits of this is you don't have to worry about cutting it or sewing it. You order the pieces uh, as they are uh, already pre-cut or in this case die cut and you're going to print on paper and then you can even use a flat press as opposed to a calendar press. Now a flat press is in a lot of cases going to be about a quarter of the price of a calendar unit and using the flat press will give you the ability to get into this cheaper but also you're not just printing one-offs you can print these as a gang or as a set um, lay them all in in your heat press and then press your your uh, paper on top of that uh, with this as well when you when you go to print this you're going to add bleed so that you don't have any white markings around the edge now this is not the only application that that you can use for this uh, as you can see behind me on the floor there's a yoga mat um, you can also print this as a one-off or as a blank, as I like to call it, and um, you can press this in a flat press as well. Now, there's a certain size that you're going to, that if you get a flat press at that size, you're going to spend just about as much as a calendar, and at that point, you're, you're going to be more efficient with your calendar. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later when I talk about blankets, um, because there's a certain size when it, when it, and what it, takes to make those flat presses it's going to be um, a little bit more expensive um, but some of some of your other blanks um, for that for no so uh, would be your uh, floor mats your bath mats uh, bath mats are typically 30 by 50 or uh, 18 by 24 um, very good application and very easy to use uh, a flat press for those also as well as mouse pads so i'll flip this one over so a mouse pad, another good application um, for a uh, piece goods type workflow, um, and you can use a flat press for it very easily. Now, if you have a certain volume of these, it makes sense to start using a calendar press. But again, that's something that you would need to factor in the volume and the time and everything else. But if you're looking at doing these a um, couple times a week, then this option to utilize this printer to do mouse pads on a flat press would be a very good option. So Hey Jeremy. <clears throat> go ahead. We had someone that we had someone ask if you could hold up the um yoga mat. Sure. So you can get an idea of it just because you can only see a portion of it real quick. Um of there it, you yes. go. Oh this yeah. is a big okay. one. Yes. So um and then they wanted to know if that one was done on a flat press or a calendar press i do not know exactly how this one was done um but i would assume this one this one was done on a calendar press just by the size of it um you know because it's it's about 60 inches wide and i just got blurry um it's about 60 inches wide and uh, typically uh, once you start getting into we'll talk about this when we talk about blankets once you start getting into um that size of a, like a 60 by 80 blanket or getting a heat press it's you know 80 inches by 60 inches it's going to start getting up there in price so my assumption is it's was done as, as roll to roll so but the same material can be die cut into smaller like you know it's a very good application again for bath mats um and floor mats welcome mats um, that can be done uh, smaller um, to where you would just need a good 30 by 50 heat press or a 30 by 40 inch heat press, depending on which supplier you go with um, and what they have available. And again, it makes it uh, an easy application to do that. 
So Thanks. any more questions? for right now. Very cool. So uh, another application um, we want to talk about would be so, uh, soft signage. Um, and when I talk soft signage, you're probably going, well, soft signage, I probably need a pole pocket. I need uh, a hemmed edges. You know, all, all that's true. You know, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about the, the simple sewing. Um, but right now, especially during COVID, uh, I see a lot of people start doing SEG graphics for uh, office dividers and uh, restaurant dividers between tables. So here is a um, SEG graphic for sign and display. And you can see the SEG in there. This is a um, simple sew application, but you may be thinking, well, what if I want to get into this and I don't have the sewing uh, capabilities? Well, you don't need it. There are um, companies out there that supply uh, SEG type frames, but you don't need to sew the SEG on there. So this frame has a rubber gasket inside and you can simply just push this in using a credit card. So what you can do with this, again, depending on the size of it, you can run it in, um, as a one-off and run it in your heat press in a flat press and um and that way you don't have that, that way you don't have to worry about getting a calendar unit um and you don't have to worry about using uh finishing equipment for it so you would print this um a lot of people um, some people i know that would do something like this would print them uh would pre-cut this before it's printed and so if i knew this frame was 18 by 20 then i could cut my pieces um 20 by 22 to give it some extra bleed and then um print print your piece uh, on the printer cut the paper out and then press it onto the to the pre-cut blank and then push it in 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 here without having to worry about again finishing it um, other applications if you get over over a certain size with this you're probably going to want to run to a, a calendar press um that way you can you know uh, get more efficient with it but again uh, again it depends on how much you're doing and what it's worth to you know have that but at least with this application you won't have to worry about sewing it so if we move into the next um, category where we talk about um, items that are simple sew items um, seg graphics is is one that is uh, very easy to do um, Again, it's just a piece of silicone sewn to the edge. This one just has a single stitch. And what I mean by simple sew is pretty much your straight line sews. So your, um, let's see, your 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 um, soft signage banners that need a pole pocket. Um, in the home decor side, it would be like your tapestries that you would you would print and then sew pole pockets on that. Um, so that's what I mean by by simple. So so SEG graphics would be a very good um, turn it the right way. So SEG graphics would be a very good application for your simple sew type applications. Um, typically, simple sew applications are going to be a roll to roll. So you would need at this point to look at getting into a calendar press. So um, and this gives me a good time to talk about different calendar presses as well. I don't want to get into the weeds talking about the different manufacturers, but you need to note what type of drum uh, that drums that are available uh, and the drum is the heating unit on these calendar presses and they usually come in different sizes some of them are metric but if we were to just kind of uh, on average uh, state what they are you're usually going to see a seven a six or seven inch um, a 10 inch a 12 inch 14 inch 20 inch um, when i was in production we had a couple that had 30 inch drums now, what this gives you is, say you're going to print something and you're going to dwell at it at 35 seconds. With 35 seconds on a seven-inch drum, it's going to be a lot slower uh, time than it would be on. Um, time's not a good way to say that. So, 35-second um, dwell on a seven-inch, you're going to be able. To, you're not going to be able to get as much material through the machine at one time as you would on a 14 inch drum so let's say if i had a seven inch drum 
and I was sprinting at 35 seconds, you're probably going to run around a yard a minute. And if you're going to do that on a 14-inch drum, you're going to run uh, almost two yards a minute. So your, your throughput goes up. Your dwell time doesn't, but your throughput does. And when you uh, look at the different size drums, you're going to, um, uh, if you look at the different size drums, it's going to go up in cost the bigger the drum. So that being said, so this is a, um, a simple so application. The other would be uh, headbands. Headbands is another simple application. And with this headband, it was just sewn in the, in the, um, in the inside here. Um, and what makes this good is this fabric is a very tight knit. And when I say a tight knit, it is, uh, it can be cold cut. So with that, can, hang on a second. All right, my son's got some uh, Legos he wanted to show me. Um, apologies. So uh, with this knit, this is a tight knit. It can be cold cut. And um, what I mean by that is like if you have a woven, wovens like to fray. Um, we'll look at uh, those a little bit when we when we see the pillows. They like to fray and they're very hard to deal with once they are um, cut. So you want to say hey? Come here, buddy. And say look, look over there and say hey. Okay. All right. Show everybody your Legos. Oh, cameras, cameras up there. All right. All right. Go play. Have fun. All right. So uh, your wovens are going to fray. Um, and uh, when they do, it's going to be hard to sew that. You're going to have to add an extra stitch, a finishing stitch. Uh, a lot of cases, if you have wovens, it's good to uh, hot cut those or hot knife them. Um, but this type of material is very, it's a knit and it's very, knits don't fray. Um, and it's very good to just cut this and then do a quick sew on that as well. So this is a headband um, type application. But if we want to talk about face mask, you know, a, a really good face mask application would be the gator type mask. And again, a very quick and easy sew. Just turn this inside out and sew it, and you can see the edges are actually cut, uh, cold cut. They're not heat cut. So a uh, very quick and easy way to sew these. Again, you can pre-cut these and flat press them, or you can run them roll to roll on a calendar press and um, cut them out after the calendar process. So another type uh, workflow. Well, before I move on from masks, there's other type of masks with more technical sews. So here's a face mask that was done by um, one of our customers. And it's really just a, a, a uh, tightly knit fabric, um, has a border sewn around it, and um, has the uh, elastic loop on it. So this kind of teeters between your, your uh, simple sew, your complex sew, but it's another way um, that, that we can uh, uh, do masks. So you have a, a simple gator type mask, easy sew. It's just a cut and one stitch to a little bit slightly more intricate sew um, with a mask that has a border and it also has elastic sewn to it. So, hey, Jeremy, we have a question. Sure. Um, so as far as it looks like the question is basically just asking, um, they've been seeing some of the masks out there that are blank. So, and they're hearing you talk about the the different types of sewing. They want to just understand, like, is there a um, pro or con to using a mask that's already created versus having to actually sew the mask together themselves? That's a good point. Um, so there are masks out there that are uh, pre-cut or, or as a blank. Um, so there is a benefit to using those. Um, not really a, not really any. Uh, when I say benefit, I'm talking about from a production standpoint. But it's really going to be the same type of mask, and even in a lot of cases, same type of material as, as these two. You know, so if you have a, a shop where you have a good cut and sew um, um, 
or good cut and sew line, then you can do a mask like this. If you're a simple shop and you're just trying to get masks out and provide stuff locally for your community, this may be a better option to, to do. Um, and then even simpler would be your, your mat, mask, excuse me, that is uh, already pre-cut pre and just ready to have an image sublimated on top of it. And at that point, uh, it makes it quick to get uh, out the door as well. So you, you can uh, get very, uh, very good about how you can customize those and, and get those um, out the door quickly. So yeah, whereas it's just a, a print it, press it, and ship it rather than print, press, cut, sew, and then ship. Thanks. So, yep. Uh, another thing um, that, that you can do with this is blankets. So this is a fleece type material. You can see the nap that is on it. And um, uh, sublimation, especially paper transfer, is very good for um, for this application. Um, and you can do blankets a, a number of ways. Um, the easiest way is to buy the blank pre-sewn. Um, popular sizes are 30 by 40, 50 by 60, 60 by 80. And then you can um, print these on paper and then run them through a heat press. You can calendar press them if you run roll to roll and buy the material as a roll. Uh, or if you buy it as a blank, you can use a, a flat press. But once you start getting up into your 60 by or your 50 by 60s or even your 60 by 80s, you can still flat press these. But then you're going to start looking at your cost numbers because if you um, find a press that's that big, you may can find a calendar that is the same price. So it may be a smaller drum calendar, but it may be the same price. And the leg up to having a calendar press at this point is you can produce things uh, faster and more efficiently. Whereas when you use a flat press, you are putting the material down, you're putting the paper on, on it, and then you're, you're pressing it. And then once that's done, you're taking all that off and resetting it up. Whereas on a calendar press, you run the roll of paper through, and then you're just laying the material on top of it. So you can be more efficient on that. And again, once you start getting up in the bigger sizes for your flat press, it would I feel like it would be time to start looking at a calendar press at that point. So blankets, uh, the fleece blanket type material, very good application, whether it be a cut and sew and you run it roll to roll or you buy your blanks that are pre-sawn and ready to go as a blanket. Um, a couple other simple sews. Uh, how about a pillow? Anybody want a pillow? Everybody loves pillows. My wife loves pillows. She likes to change them every season. Um, and pillows is a very good application, uh, even as a uh, a blank. So a lot of um, a lot of places will buy uh, pillows as a blank. They're already pre-cut, and they'll have a surged edge on it. And all you have to do is is uh, print your paper and then press the, the image onto the blank. And this makes it a good application for flat presses and also is a calendar press. And then the traditional way to run pillows is to uh, run them roll to roll. And then after the calendar process, you would cut them out and then sew them. It is a very easy sew. Some of you may be looking at the pillow saying, I don't know if that's an easy sew. Honestly, um, you would print this as a two-sided print, uh, flip it inside out and put a, a seam around the edge flip it back to the right side, leave the bottom open, of course, so you would cut your three sides, or you would you would sew your three sides, and you sew the, the corners just a little bit and leave this part open, put the stuffing in top of it, and then put a finishing stitch right here. So this can be a very good application, whether it's run roll to roll, or if you buy the blanks and then run them as a piece um, type, piece goods type workflow, uh, pillows is a very good simple sew application. So uh, another good simple sew application, if we go back to like the marketing side, would be um, a koozie. So this is a, a a blank koozie. This is what it looks like, and then you would put your print your paper, press this. This is a very good flat press option here as well, and then you would sew this up together. So flip it inside out, put your seam on it. And a lot of people use a serger on the inside. It just works a little better. And the finishing on the end is sewn, is sewn together a little bit better using the serger. 
So I think for simple so, um, I think that's it. Um, uh, the next portion, if we want to move into more of a complex type sew and a complex type finishing. Um, and to start with, we can talk about apparel. This is a good printer for apparel. And I have a nice, lovely dress here. that was printed on the S500 and then stitched together. Now, when we talk about apparel, we talk about dresses. These are all pattern type prints. These are all printed typically in this market they're printed as a what i like to call um i just i just forgot the word uh it's, it's what i call uh fabric by the yard um actually a couple words i forgot there uh, and th this application is you would take a pattern a step and repeat pattern you would, you would repeat it out um uh, typically in this uh, application you would you would go 60 inches wide or 62 inches wide so that you could um, ink or sublimate the whole width of the fabric. And then you would um, repeat that out as yards. So if you had a dress, dress usually takes about a yard and a half to produce. So you would print that pattern out. And then at the cutting portion of it, there would be a template that would be laid down. And then you would cut out around that template or a couple of templates laid down and you would cut those out. And uh, with that, uh, a lot of places that print patterns like this and would make apparel, they will do what's called a stack cut. So they will lay the roll out on a cutting table, goes this way, and they'll fold it over and go this way, and they will so forth and so on. And then uh, and they will lay their pattern on top of that and cut the stack out together. Um, this can also be used in sportswear. Um, and uh, with that, um, I'm sorry. Uh, so this uh, type of uh, patterning can also be used in sportswear, where you can actually cut out the blanks of the sp of the sportswear and then run your sportswear uh, as a blank. Um, so we'll uh, what you see behind me. Um, we'll talk about that here in a second. Now, uh, another application too would be again. Um, more apparel. This is a slightly different dress. I know on camera you can't tell, but it's a different material, a little bit shinier, a little bit thicker. Um, so, and also with usually with apparel, you will have an uh, an inside fabric. So, just something to note there. Now, moving on to sportswear. Uh, again, this is more of a calendar calendar press type um, application, but also in sportswear there are some cases where you could get away with a flat press. So behind me, you can see um, this yoga outfit, the same yoga outfit that, that she's wearing. And what you do in, in this um, application is you'll print out the different parts of, um, for, so for this would be like the top. So you have the front, you have the back, and then you have the side pieces that are stitched uh, stitched in right here. Now you can run this roll to roll, or you can pre cut your material or buy it pre cut. And this works really well if you have a lot of different designs, but you're always going to use the same template for the same size. And what I mean by that is if you have a large, then your large is always going to be that size. It's never going to change. So if this is a large, then you would take that cut piece and lay the front down here you lay the back down here and the sides here and then this goes through the calendar press but because this is a cut piece if you have a, a, a good size uh, flat press then you can run these on the flat press so you would cut down in your cost now if you have a high volume of these um, then it really makes sense to go to your calendar press at this point um, and traditionally with this um, I've seen it done both ways. Um, I know a lot of uh, both ways. I mean, you know, a flat press versus a calendar press. Um, and what I see is if you have certain items that you know you're gonna, that's going to be done the, the same way and you need to keep a stock of your different sizes, then it makes sense to do a, a, a print it out as a or cut the fabric out as pieces and then run this as a piece goods workflow, meaning you're going to run this in your calendar and drop the pieces on top. Now, if you do a lot of 
uh, custom designs, and also you have a quick turnaround time. So if somebody orders something and you got to get it out the door within, um, you know, 48, 72 hours, then it makes more sense to print this out roll to roll to roll. And then after the transfer process, you cut the materials out, you bundle them together and you take them to sewing and let the sewing uh, department sew up the, the designs. Um, and this also gives us uh, into the realm of technical fabrics. So technical fabrics, you're going to see a lot of in sportswear. This is a technical fabric application. So you have what I call is a uh, duck type material. It's a heavy, um, I don't know if I can show this very good on the camera, but it's a heavy woven type material. And in a lot of cases, it has a waterproofing um, type coating on it. But also, um, and it's not here, but down here, you'll see the different fabrics that are sewn in. So you have a breathable fabric here, you have a rough fabric here to protect the knees, and then you have another technical fabric here on the side. These aren't printed, but they are all sewn together to make this type of material. Other applications that have a technical type of, of uh, fabric would be um, the biking industry. So the cycling, I guess, as you would call it. And so here you have a material that is you can see it right there you can see through it so it's a breathable uh, material and it's got a certain pattern that allows it to breathe um, in a lot of cases this will also have a, a um, moisture wicking coating on it so that it will um, dry a lot faster um, and again these are a technical uh, fabric and it as well it is sublimated so and a lot of ways you can tell if something's sublimated or not you're going to see the white on the back so Sublimation is a very good application for this, uh, and polyester is really great for this market as well because, again, it's breathable, and uh, you can get very technical with it with the coatings on that on it. So, moving on, um, you know, all these applications that I talked about today, these are mainly paper to substrate applications. Um, now this printer does a very good job uh, being a hybrid printer. So that means that we can print uh, on paper like you see here, but we can also direct print to that. Now there's a, some differences here that you need to um, be on the lookout for. So if I'm gonna print this material and it's got some kind of coating on it, like a moisture wicking coating, I'm gonna paper transfer this because um, it's, when you direct print to it, it's not going to stick to it very well. It's going to be hard to keep the fabric dry or the dot pinned until you can get it to the heat transfer machine. And your washability on this too is uh, is still good, but there's going to be a lot of ink that didn't necessarily sublimate out of there. So your first wash is going to there's going to be a lot of ink that's going to come out of there. So when you paper transfer this, again the the ink leaves the paper as a gas goes into the material. At that point. Um, anything that doesn't sublimate is left on the paper. So uh, again, for, for stuff like this, a paper transfer is, is a very good um, type of application for that. Um, <clears throat> so direct printing something, what you're gonna need is a, is a material that is coded for direct to print. And that's really just a coating that keeps the dot from moving around um, once, it's, once it's printed. Um, and this printer is, is again, a very good hybrid printer, but if you're going to print direct, just be sure you get a fabric that has a good coating for direct print. Um, and we have some approved fabrics that we know work for direct print. Um, and if you have any questions on those, feel free to reach out, um, to, you can reach out to IT supplies and they can, um, they can get with us if there's any questions on that um, but you're not really going to see a lot of direct to print in the garment industry or the sportswear industry um, even a lot of home decor is still going to traditionally be paper transferred but let's say you have a really good backlit that you want to do and when you print direct for backlit you're going to want penetration into the fabric because the more penetration it um, that you have, it gives you more density, so it's going to allow less light to get through. So it's going to make your blacks look darker. Um, so 
This here is a fabric that I direct printed. So, um, and if you have any questions or need to know the fabric, please put it in the chat. I will uh, talk about the fabric, but this is the front side of it. And if I go to the back, you can see that there's a lot more penetration on there, um, especially that that is there that wouldn't be there if I would have paper transferred it. So again, it allows the, the ink to go a little bit further into the material and it makes it a very good application for backlit. But again, do your homework, make sure you have a good material if you choose to um, direct print. Now, another application is for direct print, it's going to be sign, or not sign, it's gonna be flags. Um, now, earlier on, I forgot to mention that you can actually buy like garden flags pre-sewn. So that would be a very good application. Again, that's gonna be a paper transfer because they're, they're um, pre-sewn. That's a very good application, especially for a very small heat press because some of those garden signs are like 14 by 16. So a good application to get into this without having to worry about sewing. And if it's gonna be outdoors, um, make sure it's seasonal. Um, these inks, are a hybrid ink set, which means it's very good for paper transfer and direct to print. Um, and uh, it is a low low energy dispersed dye, which means that the um, outdoor the ability outdoor uh, the fade it doesn't have very good fade resistance. So outdoors, depending on the time of year, it's only going to last from anywhere from four to six months. Um, and so you know. If you have a garden flag, just you know, make sure it's seasonal. So you'd put it out for summer and then put it back in and put up a fall one. You know, I know, you know, my mom likes to do that. She's got one for you know, I, I think for every month. So um, an application there. But other other uh, uses for for flag would be um, the uh, big teardrop flags that you would see outside of a barber shop or outside of a um, a restaurant, especially now, a lot of restaurants are starting to reopen, so they are wanting to have as much curbside exposure as possible. So being able to print your flagged material here as a direct print means that you have visibility on the flag material on both sides. Again, when we talked about direct, we talked about how uh, it penetrates the fabric. So you can see here almost little difference between the front and the back. So for this application here, it's probably about 90% front to back. Uh, again, it depends on your flag material. Not all flags are going to allow the ink to go through the same way. So again, do your homework on the type of material or what you want to accomplish with the application and then what type of material that you can get to accomplish that. So when I talk about polyester fabrics, so all these applications that I've showed you are 100% polyester. Um, some, like the pillow fabric, has a little bit of cotton in it, so it's like an eight, it's like a 90/10. So uh, with that, you're just not going to get as much color pop. Um, but uh, when I talk uh, about polyester fabrics, uh, especially in the home decor market, a lot of people uh, worry about the sustainability of polyesters, being that it's a synthetic fabric and that it um, isn't necessarily green like cotton fabric is. So um, polyesters come in a long way. There's a lot of material out there that actually have a look and they feel like, poly like cotton, even though they're polyester and that's very good for the pillow market, the curtain market, the shower curtain market. So something to take a look at. But, um, and polyesters are, again, like I said, coming a long way. And um, they have started making polyesters with recycled bottles. So here is a type of fabric. Um, it is a it's a value text fabric, and this is made from 100% recycled bottles. So um, what you can start talking about if anybody does say anything about uh, um, being green like cottons are, then you can talk about sustainability. You know, look into getting fabrics that are um, that are, are recycled. So, and last but not least, um, I get a lot of questions about rigid substrates. 
Now, last week we talked about the pros and the cons of the thermal inkjet print head. And uh, what we talked about with these print heads is that we have a 12 picoliter dot. Now, this works great in applications on uh, substrates like fabric. And <clears throat> again, when you think about it, the dot leaves the paper as a gas. So that dot once it's gassed into the fibers of the material, it looks a little bit different than it does on the paper. Um, now, uh, when we talk about rigids, we're not really in this market, um, you know, but I know a lot of people that try it, and, you know, I decided to try it myself and see what it exactly looks like. Now, if we talk about rigids as fine art, this is not one of those. Uh, applications that you should even consider um, printing on a rigid with fine art. But this is just a little piece of Chromalux that I printed out on our S300. And it doesn't look bad. The color you can see is there. And let's see if I can get the glare out of here. But in some of your areas, you're going to see a little bit of a grain pattern. Now, again, that's why I say it's not for a mug. It's maybe not for a um, fine art type application, but if I step back, this could be a good application for uh, your um, car tag. So you have your little license plate tag on the front of your car that you want something cool to say on it. This might be a good application for that. Or what about keychains, door hangers, something that you know doesn't have a lot of pictures but has more um, vector type images would be a very good um, uh, way to do that. But just note, in some of your colors, you are going to see a little bit of grain um, because of, of this um, technology. And also, um, definitely, if you are interested in doing something like this for fine art, this is definitely not the printer to do that. Um, I think that pretty much concludes uh, all of the material that I have here. Um, so I will turn it over to Malia, uh, and before moving any forward, any way forward, I want to thank IT supplies for, uh, allowing me to, uh, come and discuss, um, <clears throat> HP and the stitch and also the applications that we can achieve on our stitch. So that being said, Malia, if we have any questions, feel free to, uh, ask away. All right, let me see. I'm pulling up the question box now. So it doesn't look like I have anything right now, so I'll start our outro and then we'll work our way back around to see if we have anything there. So thank you so very much, Jeremy. That was a lot of information in a short period of time. Awesome. You was a lot literally of blew through that. That was crazy. Um, and learned a lot along the way as well. So that was really great. Um, yeah. At this time, we're, guys, we want you to go ahead and put some questions in the chat box if you have any. Um, but while we do wait for those to appear, just want to take a moment to tell you a little bit about IT Supplies. As many of you know, IT Supplies is here to support your needs for everything related to the perfect print. Our knowledgeable staff and technical support specialists are here to help you with supplies and support to keep your business running. In addition, we are posting daily videos on our YouTube channel to help you with many of your commonly asked questions. So please contact your sales representative for any assistance that you may need. And if you don't know how to contact your rep, please call 800-771-9665 and ask for a commercial sales specialist. We are here to help you and your business succeed. So let me see that I get anything extra real fast. Um, give me just a moment clicking on it. So one of the questions I got was, is the S300 a good starter printer or should I go to a 44 inch printer because the 64 inch seems a little big? Uh. The S300 is a good starter printer, uh, definitely no doubt. Um, you know, does 64 sound kind of big? Maybe, you know, maybe the stuff that you have is going to be pre-cut um, and you don't necessarily need that width. 
but what it does give you is the ability to go to different widths. You know, um, if uh, like case in point, if I'm going to buy a roll of 64 inch media and I'm going to do a pr cut print job, my heat press is uh, 30 by 50, 30 inches by 50 inches, then I'm going to print um, a printout, you know, uh, nested uh, jobs. And I have more, if I'm gonna use 64 inch paper, I'm gonna have more width to do that. Um, also, uh, if you're going to do a roll to roll type application or even look to doing that, then you, you won't be able to do that with 44. I mean, you won't be able to do it efficiently with 44 inch. So fabric is usually 60 inches wide. So being able to utilize the full width of the fabric at one time using a 64 inch printer. So I think, you have a lot more bells and whistles with, um, or what's a good way to say it? You have a lot more freedoms with a 64 inch printer, starting out with a 64 inch printer than you do with a 44 inch printer. Sweet. The other thing was, um, I got another one. Do you always have to use a 64 inch roll of paper? Nope. You kind of nope. sort of answered it, but if you can go in more depth. Yeah, so you can go down on this printer, you can go down to, to 24 inch paper. Um, uh, and if you were on the call last week, we talked about the um, color calibration. So that color calibration, you need uh, at least 36 inch paper to do the color calibration. So I would say a good standard on this is, is 36 inches, but you can go down to 24 inch, um, just as long as you're not gonna do the color calibration on that. Awesome. The next question I had was, can you print on any color fabric or does it have to be white fabric? So it has to be um, white fabric. Uh, the, the essential process of this is that um, even though we, we print it out in an inkjet printer, this ink in the chemistry of it is a dye. So and that dye is going to um, coat the fabric in a way. Um, and if you have a dark material, it's only going to, it, it may dye that material, but you're not going to see the effects of that. So if you have a black shirt and you press something onto the shirt, it's going to uh, absorb it, but you won't be able to see it because the color is, is black. So um, you're going to want to use white fabric. Now there are ways, and um, there is a company that makes a ty an adhesive type of uh, vinyl that you can press to a cotton shirt and then take your image and press that on top of that vinyl. So, you know, that would give you the ability to print onto cottons uh, in a roundabout way, if that makes sense. Um, but a long way to answer your question, yeah, you need to use white fabric um, unless you have like an application you can um, press to that material and then put your, um, put your ink on the application. So did I, did I lose you? Oh, can you hear me? Yep, can now. All right. So it looks like that's actually all the questions that we have from what I just went through. Um, and that'll, that'll conclude our webinar. So thanks so much, Jeremy. Um, Thank you. Be on the lookout, guys, for more information on new series, videos, and much, much more. Thank you to all of our attendees. You guys have been tremendous. Take care. Have a great day and a good holiday weekend. Hope you guys are barbecuing some stuff and having some time with the fam. Thanks so much for watching this. If you would like to see more of these videos, please go to our YouTube channel.